Now, SMPD, all about standards, standards matter, right? And we watched, as a television industry, we watched the audio industry go through a period of non-standardness about how they did audio over IP. And we said, well, let's not make that mistake again. So in coordination with the Video Services Forum and the Advanced Media Workflow Association and the AIMS, which is the Alliance for IP Media Solutions, and of course the AES, all the standards groups worked together to create standards for moving the television industry and related post and film and other things into IP. So of course, SMPTE had some existing work, 2022 and 2059 PTP, um, 2110 was really the, the focal point of this effort, as well as some work in AMWA on control protocols. Now the good news about 2110 is it's a finished piece of work. So if someone tells you, oh, I'm waiting for it to be finished, no, no, they're waiting for their product to be finished, they're waiting for their development team to be finished. The standards work here is quite complete. In fact, we're in the, you know, one year review phase on some of these documents now to uh, clean up some implementation feedback. Now, 21.10.10 is largely about how the parts of the production stay in sync, because in 21.10, the video and the audio and ancillary data flows are all separate signals in the network. So you might have microphones all over a football pitch, you might have cameras all over the stadium, and the expectation is that in the places where those signals combine, that they have to combine in phase correctly. Particularly for audio, getting the sound field correct, it's super important that the network delays don't screw up the sound field. But equally, in the cameras, it's super important that when they hit the vision mixer, the cameras are all timed up properly, because otherwise you might be, you know, fading between two cameras that are, say, a frame or two out, it looks quite bad. Um, so how do we make the parts stay in sync? Well, SDI was really good at this because it was just this bundle and things couldn't break apart if they tried. But in 2110, since it's all separate, every separate signal, whether it's video, audio, ancillary data, they get time stamped. So we use PTP to distribute so every device in the entire network has a sense of time and knows what time it is quite accurately. And so when they grab a frame of video from the sensor or they grab an audio sample from the sound field, they timestamp it. And these timestamps are accurate. And then when things travel through the network, they might take different delays, they might take different paths, all kinds of bad things can happen. But in the end, when it hits the mixer or hits the vision mixer, which in America we call production switcher, they are all retimed back together so you can produce your video, you can produce your audio, and in the end you can match those up as well. So you really can mix and match any essence from any source in a large 2110 network and expect them to be synchronized. Now these RTP timestamps, what do they mean? Well they are, according to this RFC from 20 years ago, the sampling time of the media. And for video, you know, there's a lot of discussion over what that means and really it's just the sampling time for the purpose of matching it to the audio. Because, you know, video you're integrating light over time and it's a you know, very complicated thing you're doing. With audio, thankfully, it's much simpler. Um, it's the time that you captured the audio sample. So that's what these timestamps mean. We use a thing called Session Description Protocol or SDP. It's just a little binder clip of information about a stream, but it's a very standardized, rigid format so that every device speaks the same way in terms of describing these are the streams I make or here's a stream you should receive. And then this AMWA ISO 5 protocol, which again, you can go to another track and hear a whole talk about that, is a standardized way that a receiver can be told, take this stream. So that's 21.10.10, that's the system. Now there's a different document, 20, that describes video, 30 describes audio, 40 describes ancillary data. I'm on a schedule, so we're gonna be quick. 21.10.20 is uncompressed video. Now why uncompressed? Well, I've been involved in video compression for the first, you know, 90% of my career, and video compression, if there's one thing I learned, it's never finished, 
there's always another codec. Every month there's another codec. Everybody's got a different codec, and everybody thinks their codec is the best one. So doing uncompressed video meant that we never had to justify why we picked this codec or that codec because these are the samples. They're raw, they're yours, use them. So we only send the samples. Now, historically in television, there was this blanking interval. And if you wanna know what the blanking interval is, find somebody with a beard grayer than yours and ask them, what is the blanking interval about? But do it offline because it's a story. Um, we don't send the blanking interval anymore in 2110, uh, SDI does. So we wanted to make 2110 ready for the future. So we support image sizes up to 32K by 32K. Now, that isn't common in television. It isn't common in film even, although we're, we're approaching it. But it's pretty common in medical imaging to have really large images. Um, we support lots of different color spaces and colorimetries. We support lots of different sampling schemas, um, more than I listed there. And of course, we support HDR, including PQ and HLG, and there's work underway to add S-Log3 in there. Um, how much bandwidth did we save by getting rid of the blanking? Well, we saved a lot. I mean, if you're in North America, it's only you know 16%. If you're in Europe, it's 30%. 30% of the bandwidth of an SDI signal was blanking. That means in 1080p 50, you know, there's two gigabits of content and a gigabit of blanking. That's a lot. So. We, we don't send that junk anymore. Now, are we ready for the future? Yes. Um, 32K images ought to hold us for a while. The frame rate can be anything you want. It's specified as a ratio of integers, so we don't have a way to specify irrational frame rates, but I don't think that's gonna be an actual issue. Um, you can signal which HDR system and which colorimetry, so you can add different color spaces and different frame, you know, different uh, HDR systems over time. It's really only limited by the size of the ethernet you're putting it on. And so if you talk to the switch industry, 100 gigabit has become, you know, the table stakes standard, everybody supports it. And 400 gig is shipping now from Cisco and Arista and Juniper and, you know, sort of the usual suspects. So, you know, 100 gig will hold eight UHD streams. That's pretty good. 400 gig will hold eight, eight, K, eight K streams. So look forward to that. So moving on to audio. Audio, we said, gee, the AES spent a long time getting AES 67 right. Let's use it. So we didn't reinvent audio for television. We said, Let's use AES-67. Now, AES-67 is a document that says, everything must do this, you know, shall support this, but if you do any of these other things, here's how you do it. And so it's led to some confusion because the document describes a huge number of things you could do, but only a small subset of them are actually required. And so in 2110, we said, well, our level A is the things that are required in AES 67, and then we have a level B and a level C that includes some of the things that are optional so that you can specify, hey, I want devices that comply with this. Um, but if you're gonna use things outside that kind of core feature set of AES 67, you do have to read the manual kind of carefully on the things you're using. So this is my view of audio for television people, right? So you've got audio, you've got a mixer, and magic happens in the middle. But really, the audio gets sampled, and usually 48K, but not always. Um, you get to choose how you map the samples into packets, and there's some system design challenges around that. And of course, there's a switch, and not to be forgotten, there's a PTP generator somewhere that's generating time out to all those systems. So that red sample is in the same place in the same packets coming out of every sampler, and those packets have timestamps that are from PTP, so later on downstream at the mixer, you can net out all of the network delays and be left with the sound field just like you captured it. So, now, how about non-PCM audio? Because AES-67, important safety tip, was completely designed around PCM audio. It's designed to carry sound. It's not designed to carry 
metadata, object metadata, all the other things that people are now making AES3s full of stuff that's not sound. Um, so there's a 2110.31 standard which provides a way to take an AES3, the entire thing, the PCU, V bits, everything you want, and it's all tunneled through IP. And so that way if you have, say, an object sound mix with a metadata channel, that metadata channel can transport over AES3 using 2110.31 in parallel with the sound field data to be, you know, processed downstream. So it works, it's been used, it's uh, evidence in the field. Now, ancillary data is another thing that happens, right? In television, for years in SDI, we've been burying stuff up in the ancillary data. Well, some of it has to do with the video, some of it has to do with captions or subtitles. Some of it's unrelated, you know, some of it is, uh, in Europe, there's a lot of teletext that's, you know, pages of, you know, help wanted ads or whatever is in all the teletext that's not subtitle. Some of it's just along for the ride. But in 2110, we had a way to carry it. So um, the IETF wrote an RFC that says how to wrap ancillary packets in IP, and then 211040 says how to use that system in conjunction with the rest of 2110 so that everything is timed together and operating by the same playbook. Now, this gives us a curious capability we never had before. You know, we always talk about audio breakaway, but now you can actually break away ancillary data, which is different. So the ancillary data is, you know, subtitles, teletext, things like that. So you can now build systems where the captioner generates 2110 directly. The downstream trigger, you know, the SCUDI 104 system generates 211040 directly. So there's no need to have SDI looping through a bunch of inserters. Instead, you just have these signals in the network and you use the one you need where you need it. Um, the last bit you'll read about is 2022-8, which says when you're using 2022-6 with a 2110 system, how does that all fit together? And this exists because in a practical sense, there are systems built like this, so we wanted to document the actual use pattern. So, is this system perfect? Because, you know, we spent a long time making it, and if you listen to some of the marketing, it'll sound like 2110 is the right solution for everything. Well, it is a really good solution for large-scale projects, big trucks, big facilities, any place that needs to do a non-trivial amount of UHD, um, distributed venue campus environments like we find in a lot of university sporting events or in football stadiums or baseball stadiums, um, things where there's really one management domain, one PTP domain, but maybe a lot of spread out. Now 2110's not perfect for some things too. It's really not ideal for getting to and from the cloud. Uses a lot of bandwidth, not very tolerant of errors. Um, it's not really great for cost sensitive links, like getting from sporting venues back to your studio. There's other ways to do that that just make more economic sense. Um, it's not always great for interchange between arm's length unrelated parties, although there's a working group talking about that, so that's in one of the other tracks. Um, but it is good for the things it's good for, and that's a lot of things. So a little tiny bit about control, and then I'll turn it over to Eric. Because, um, you know, it's neat to have bits on the wire, but how do you control it? Well, you use these AMWA specs, so the ISO 4 and ISO 5 are the control specs that go with 2110 and describe how to control devices, how to find the devices. So this ISO 4 says when you're a device, you wake up, you register into a registry, and that's how everything else in the system knows how to find you. It's compare that with the current practice where you have a big spreadsheet and you fill it in when you screw it into the rack. Um, ISO 5 is the companion that says, once you know about a device, how do you tell it what to do? How do you tell it to eat a stream or to, you know, identify what streams it's generating? And so that's the ISO 5 and how things fit together. So that's your whirlwind introduction to 2110. Um, if you have questions, there's detailed tracks or I'll be hanging around after the session and uh, that's probably the end of that little topic. Now, our next topic, just clear your mind and turn your head 30 degrees, 
Uh, Eric Cazell is going to talk about digital cinema stuff, and he's from Dolby, but I first met him at the Advanced Television Technology Center in Braddock Place 175,000 years ago. But I aged and he didn't, so go figure. All right, so I'm going to give you a little bit of a discussion about the topics that are going to be discussed in the cinema session, and I think that's later today. If not, it's tomorrow. But the idea is that we have three great papers in that session, and they all address uniquely different topics, and I thought I'd give a little background about what the topics are trying to consider. So the first paper is going to be about archiving, and considering archiving and restoration, and how that process is done, and how it might be readdressed based on technology that is current, and also storytelling itself. And when we think about archiving, in a generic sense, we're talking about packing up your data. You've done a project, you're packing it up, and you want to have the ability for somebody, somewhere along the way, to be able to restore that data, look at your work. And, and this is not even talking about filmmaking, this is just talking about what you do when you're librarying something. And of course, the preservation is, you know, what is that platform? How do you describe it? And you have to think about restoration in the sense of maybe something archaeological, right? You're considering that you might pack this data up and it might be revisited 10 years later, 50 years later, 100 years later. And so your capacity to be there to describe the events may not, you know, be possible. And of course, restoration. And restoration obviously involves restoring the data based on an instruction set that you have, but it also involves understanding how that data could have been mapped based on technology or tools at the time and repairing data that could be damaged in the process. And that damage could be part of the archiving process itself and it could be external factors involved in that. And in that restoration or repair data, you come up with artifacts. And obviously we are all very familiar with what an artifact is. Uh, it's something that is basically uh, forced into the process based on either part of the archiving, an unintended consequence of it, or part of the restoration, an unintended consequence of that. It is a fingerprint of the process that's not part of the system itself. And when we talk about traditional archiving of cinema format material, basically what they would do is they'd throw everything into a box, maybe label it a little bit, and put it into a salt mine. And you would have everything thrown into a salt mine, and they do that that extended into video, and that extended into uh, television broadcasts. Basically everything, if possible, would get put on, hopefully, a hygronomically uh, safe environment. In this case, this is a salt mine, and the, this is a neat little story, actually. A friend of mine, a geophysicist, about a year and a half ago, was working in some uh, mines in Kansas and stumbled onto these shells and happened to find some feature film content that was stored there. So the salt mine story is very true. Um, and that's how they'd store it. And sometimes you'd have EDL, sometimes you'd have an instruction set on paper and, and you'd get all that data back. Um, sometimes they, these things would be stored on a shelf in a warehouse and the warehouse would burn down and you'd lose things. So, you know, we've made really good efforts to try and at least preserve that. When we think about digital archiving though, things get a little more complicated. You start talking about picture formats, uh, data that's, that's a file. It's not really a, a tangible element anymore. And you have to store it onto a digital tape. And that digital tape is going to have a file system. And that file system needs to be managed. Maybe that's going to be on a hard drive. Who's to say that EXT2 is going to be useful in five or 10 years? And you've got audio media, you know, all these session stems and everything else that comes with it. You've got the EDLs. You've got, you know, a color grading session. You've got something that's done on an Avid. And ultimately, you're going to have, in the case of cinema, you're going to have a DCDM, right? That is sort of the burned-in data format that's stored on a platform. And you could have other alternate DCDMs for a format, maybe something for IMAX or a 3D presentation. And ultimately, what you get at is a huge pile of stuff. And this prompted the Academy to publish several documents called The Digital Dilemma, because once you started to actually pull all this media together, certain feature films, especially very large-scale ones, would start to produce data approaching a petabyte in size. And I don't know about you, but trying to figure out how to store a petabyte of data, right, that's been spinning on disk is a challenge on its own. Trying to organize that data and store it somewhere else with the chance of recovering it, a lot of, lot of things to consider there. So when we talk about archiving, we talk about what the first paper is going to really consider. We want to consider color space, your file format, how you're going to store the media, 
and then a whole litany of ethical considerations that you want to consider about how the storyteller might consider telling that story in the future. So color space, basically, you know, how we look at color space was established in 1931 in a study by the International Committee on Illumination. And it was based on some tests that were done in the 1920s to establish what we know as the CIE 1931 color space model. And that's a tri-stimulus model using long, medium, and short range uh, responses of the human retina, the cones and rods in our eyes, which roughly are equivalent to the colors red, green, and blue. Hopefully that starts to make some sense now. And when we look at it, this is what we have developed. This is the CIE locus, and this is how color space is mapped and how it's presented when you're starting to talk about interchange of data. And it's basically a 2D representation of every color that the human eye can perceive. And in that, we have now created subcolor spaces or smaller color spaces that basically go and describe the capabilities of a system, a camera, a display. And the first one is very popular. We know it quite well as REC 709 or ITU REC 709. And it's basically based on the phosphor responses of a CRT tube, I guess, probably in the 80s or 90s. And that defines what we have as a traditional color space on most TVs that were produced up until about the last three or four years. Now, as technology advances, we come up with different color spaces. And then more recently, we've created the P3 color space that's used in digital cinema. That's based on the filter response of a xenon light source. And you can see it's about 20% larger than REC 709. More recently, REC 2020 has, well, let's, has been created, and that's based on the primary responses of very narrow wavelength laser sources. And you can see it's significantly wider than what we have in the prior two color spaces. But the challenge comes that if you're trying to archive or store this data for eternity, ideally you would like to be able to map your data into and out of a color space that covers the entire visual system. And so the Academy created the ACES format. We've heard that buzzword come around, and it's the Academy Color Encoding System. And that basically creates a theoretical triangle around the entire viewable color uh, environment of the human eye. So there's negative values. There's, there's imaginary values in that space. But ostensibly, your color scientists, the team you work with, will have the capacity to take any data and accurately map it into and out of, well, theoretically, anything that we could ever perceive. So the next point of consideration, we'll gloss over this one, is how do you store your data? And obviously the decision you have to make is when you're working with uh, a, a feature film, you're considering uh, working with raw files, the negative, you know. And in the case of digital media, raw files are produced or created and t often protected by the camera manufacturer themselves or the, the system manufacturer. So you might have something specifically from RED, and only RED truly knows how to decode and present that data. And you're going to have something from ARI, and ARI is a little more uh, documented. Canon is well documented. Nikon holds on to their secret sauce a little bit, but basically every camera source out there has very specific tools that they use to protect their IP. And while that's lovely, certainly if you're trying to reevaluate content 50 or 100 years later, or you're trying to look at restoring it, Perhaps the reds of the world don't exist anymore, or the Aries don't exist anymore. Well, we'll see, hopefully. And because of that, what you probably want to consider is an open standard. And there are several of them. Some of them have been worked on by Simti. Some of them have been worked on by uh, other groups. But uh, Lucasfilm's original implementation of op OpenEXR is probably one of the most resolute uh, formats that you can use for storing data. But obviously, you've got TIFF and DPX formats that are used very heavily for interchange, and that is because they are well understood and well documented. I can give John a TIFF file, and his system will understand how to use that. It doesn't matter. And that's going to call you know, from legacy systems all the way up to systems of the future. But then we get into some of the really challenging parts of the topic, and these are ethical choices, and archivists have to consider this every time they revisit a movie. How do you present the data if you, as a person in the future, a person now, are able to embrace that story with new technology? Would the creative want you to present the data in a new and interesting way? 
uh, recently in our lab, we were able to work on The Wizard of Oz again. And this is one that we've actually worked with Warner over the few, uh, last few years to try and understand. Assuming that we had access to the creative, would you want to revisit how they did that movie? Right? Technicolor was this vast new technology at the time. It was exciting. And how they produced that, you know, they, they created this wonderfully colorful world. Assuming that they had access to a laser-based projection system or a, you know, HDR display, would they choose to tell that story differently? More often than not, we go down the conservative route and we try to preserve the image as it was. But these are the ethical considerations that you want to consider as you go down that story. And then, of course, more recently, we have to consider digital representation of an actor. And I'm using actor specifically, not character. Obviously, we've created dozens of digital characters over the years, some of them very awe-inspiring in the performance. But in a restoration effort, do we have the legal rights? Do we, should we create a new performance from a character to suit the needs of a, a, a future display or a future technology? And so that sort of goes into the discussion that the restoration or archiving for the future paper will start to uh, discuss for us. Another paper starts to try and develop a net metric of what are we doing when we're putting all these photons on a screen? How do we measure it? And more importantly, how does that impact the viewer? And as we start to explode the premium large format theater formats, here's just a smattering of them, you have to consider as we get brighter and brighter in the cinematic world, what are we doing to the end user's visual experience? You know, as we consider digital cinema, we've talked about historically light, light levels in traditional cinema, anywhere up to 14 foot Lamberts on a good day. But maybe we're down to like three foot Lamberts, five foot Lamberts, depending on presentation. Digital cinema tried to standardize that and keep us at 14 foot Lamberts consistently across the system, or at least something that's easily measurable. PLF's early ones, IMAX's early film presentations, tried to uh, master at the same level. But now that we start to see these advanced formats from IMAX or Dolby or Samsung, we're talking about 20 plus foot Lamberts, 30, 50, 100 foot Lamberts. You know, and, and they've only been around for five years or so. So we're really starting to consider what exactly these do to presentation. And what is that measurement? It's, you know, peak luminance. We talk about peak luminance. And peak luminance is a measurement of the brightness part of the image relative to the ambience of the room itself. You can certainly show 14-foot Lamberts on this screen in a brightly lit sunny day, and it'll have a very different impact on a user than it does in a low-light room. And how that's measured depends on physics of the display system itself. You have to consider, is it a full white image that you're throwing on a screen or a subsection of that screen? What's the power and what's the duration of that exposure? And all that goes into both the display technology itself, but potentially the optics system that you're using to drive that display. And of course, there's the human eyeball. And you have to consider the human eyeball, which is an amazing part of our body, the different pieces of it that constitute how we perceive that light, right? The, the primary systems that are basically perceiving and reacting to incoming light. You've got your iris and pupil, the lens system, and then of course the retina, which is you know, embedded with all the rods and cones, and how that reacts photochemically to input data. And to date, there has been no study that's really gone in and tried to document the impact of high brightness or higher brightness cinema experiences. Certainly many experiences that we've seen on uh, small format screens, but what is that on a large format screen in low light? And so, that paper starts to consider, are there health issues? Are there aversion? Well, how does that react? And when you design your metric, you want to consider that. What is your decay rate? What is the ambience of the room? And more importantly, what is discomfort? How does that work? Is it an eye blink? Is it, you know, an aversive look from your eyes looking away from the screen? Is it pain that's instituted from uh, too much exposure? And at those levels, how might your eye recover over time? How is that used in the presentation itself? The last paper explores uh, uniformity of cinema experience, specifically in France, but they also start to extrapolate how that might be used as a standard around the world. And the idea is, obviously, there are a number of different ways that we will measure a film experience. Uh, digital has gone a long way to sort of correct issues of frame rate and print quality and print degradation over time. 
But you have to consider, especially in the case of video walls and, and laser-based projection systems, how do you measure and qualify a screen and say, yep, this is falling within the standards that we want to operate in? And obviously, big measurement points that we have in any sort of uh, optical-based system, you have to look at vignetting. Anytime you use an, a, a lens-based system, you're looking at vignetting and how uh, a human react or how a screen responds to that, as well as geometric. Uh, issues, keystoning, pin cushioning, trapezoid, uh, alignment, you know, all the sort of things that you have to consider in your system. And then, of course, light-based issues, uniformity of the light, contrast, and, again, our friend peak brightness. And one of the things that was sort of discovered in studies is that architectural versus exhibition-based implementations often contradict each other because architectural-based standards often talk about a room needs to be rectangular in design, and it needs to have exit lights, and it needs to have an exit row specifically for people that are handicapped. And that, in and of itself, can impact what the exhibition design guidelines say, where we have to have a rake of 20 degrees, and we have to have a presentation of uh, you know, 100 foot Lamberts in a room with a brightness of 0 0.01 candelas. Well, I mean, that's a little absurd, but, but the idea is that they can contradict each other. And so in this French study, they actually have the capacity to readdress all their needs in the confluence of the two standards bodies that are operating uh, with each other. Anyhow, there are quite often guidelines more than real rules that they follow. And so hopefully, we'll be able to get to a point where there are global standards that will dictate what cinematic presentation should be at a minimum. And that's looking at uh, the cinema uh, presentations in a nutshell. And our next speaker is Yvonne Thomas from DTG UK. And she's going to talk to us about cloud. So good morning, everyone. Um, so this session that's happening this afternoon is about the clout. And uh, so the title, Is It an All-Rounder Talent? Because clout is being used so often, like for everything, and clout seems to solve all of the problems that we have in our business. Now, how do I? This way. Um, so therefore, the question, is it really a talent that solves all the problems, or is it actually something else, or does, does enable nice things that we do. So the session is this afternoon in the room next door at 4 p.m. Uh, we have three presentations from Harmonic, NBC Universal, and uh, NetInsight. So you should look at them and, and listen because they're quite interesting and they all have very different perspectives. So a little comic from Dilbert. Uh, I'm sure you all know Dilbert. Um, and that's quite funny because uh, it's very, very easy to misunderstand the clouds. Um, so if the boss says, I welcome any input on our corporate strategy, well, I think we need to be more customer-centric. You mean raise your prices? I mean focus on the needs of our customers? You mean we should be monopoly so they need us? We should find out what they need and then give, that, give it actually to them. So. They need to buy our products. Well, they probably don't. So you're saying our marketing campaign should use psychological manipulation to make people think they need our products. Well, you finally had a good idea. I'm going to stop talking to you. So it's, it's actually quite funny because the perception really is that um, the clouds you know, just enables everything and suddenly we make a lot of money, but actually the cloud enabled to be much more customer-centric and focused on what we need at the time we need it. So that's a complete different um, way of thinking. Looking at IT overall, and IT technology is coming more and more into our, um, our industry, um, means we just use the technology that coming, that's coming from other industries but we adopt it in a way that we can just use it and makes it appropriate for, for what we need, so for those applications that we use in, in our industry. 
um, while in the classic IT world or in the traditional IT world that we all had where department, departments were separated and there was an own IT department that just did whatever they wanted to do but didn't really focus on the operation departments um, and didn't really align on the daily business. Um, they had to cover all these um, areas that you see here on the left. And then when we look at uh, cloud models, um, so the, the black box becomes bigger and bigger actually, which means we just use the technology, we don't know how it works, um, maybe we don't even care or we just try to understand how to use it, how to implement it, how to shape it in a way that we can use it uh, in the way we want to and we don't have to worry about it anymore um, because it's scalable, we just use it whenever we need to and it's a done deal and at some point we just you know, pay for it and that's it. So um, when we look at uh, statistics and what analysts um, expect, so in the next, uh, yeah, about six years, um, the enterprise will have shut down their traditional data center and move into the cloud, so at about 80%. Uh, which is a big shift if we look at the figures from last year, definitely. Um, so, so of course, there's a, there's a whole business behind running a data center uh, on an enterprise level, but now they've been, they will be outsourced. Um, um, again, just meaning we just use the technology whenever we need to. So if we just look back in history, um, the Industrial Revolution made power on demand. So it was more accessible to the industry, but at some point every household had power, they had light, um, they, you know, at some point of course there was television technology and then all that stuff in our homes. Um, and whenever we needed light, we just switch on um, and that's it. And then we pay for it at the end of the month that was completely different um, before. And it's the same happening actually with the cloud, um, like a revolution. IT is on demand suddenly, whenever we need this infrastructure, whenever we need a server for, for coding, when, whenever we need storage. Um, so it's all there whenever we need it. In the cloud, there are so many perspectives to consider and we tend to forget in our technology world that there is so much more around this. There are people, it means we need to have different skill sets, people need to think in a different way, so just what we heard the last five minutes, this paradigm change. Uh, look at business models, of course, they, they are already changing and drastically have changed, um, but they will also continue to change in the future. How platforms are being run, processes, the way they they being organized will be very different. Um, look at maturity, operations and the implications on, on them, but mostly security is really a fact where most people are worried about when thinking about the cloud. Because suddenly I give all the data, all the information, all my assets that, that are so much of value to me to somebody else and I can't really control what this person is doing or what this organization is doing with my data. So therefore, there are a lot more aspects to consider when we talk about the cloud, um, even though of course we look into technology. I'm just saying that we should never forget the ethics and people behind. So this chart, you don't need to fully read this, um, but this is only an overview of uh, what is possible in various areas. Um, whether this is really from, we've heard a lot on analytics and AI tools, um, cognitive services, management tools, um, internet of things, so everything that's in our smart home is driven through the cloud. Um, um, mobile services as well and also, and that's a new area that enterprise models use the cloud as well, so for their applications. There's certainly a couple of advantages and if we look at it more from a um, yeah, business point of view, of course it all makes sense that 
the global infrastructure that we had to run on our premises uh, was hugely expensive, not only to hire the people who yeah, operate the infrastructure, um, but also considering all the maintenance and everything that comes with it, uh, as well as creating a network that's being secure, people and, and our organization have access to, even from the outside maybe, that yeah, this is all being safe. We need to have computers, storage, databases, all handy, all the time, 24 hours. Um, look at automation, application services on top, and then of course at the overall operations. And that costs a hell lot of money to run. So a lot of things will change or have changed already, and this is from really lower overall costs, so the shift to uh, operational costs, there are no capacity limits anymore um, because whenever I need capacity, I can just get it easily with one click. There are no refresh cycles um, because the cloud is always up to date. There's nothing I have to worry about uh, to, to run you know, really bulky uh, updates and just to watch out that I always have the latest um, uh, software and everything installed. So yeah, and by this, of course, everything is scalable. Um, but also the flexibility that we have to decide on a business level and take decisions what's good for our customers is just the essence. Because through the flexibility that we have through the cloud, we can take those decisions not to worry about um, the, the, the actual business side and the cost side as well. And when we think about what, what can we do with the cloud, the customer focus um, and the focus on, on the business we do with our partners and customers is much, much higher than it was before. Because if I run the infrastructure, I have to get all you know contracts and to, to keep it running. So I have to find partners and, um, and customers who need this infrastructure. So it's always run at 100% ideally in order to finance it. But now this is much easier. And this is a lot about not to lose opportunities or let's say to win opportunities um, where in the traditional world you had to scale for the worst case. And if you figure it out that wasn't enough, then you would stack up and stack up again. And at some point, this infrastructure might be too big, of course, uh, and you might just recognize, well, it's hugely expensive infrastructure that mm, probably 95% of your time you don't need really. So if we look at actually the real demand, you're never right. So you lose opportunities and you have costs that are involved um, when the opportunities are, don't exist when they're not there. But through the cloud, we can, st we can really scale it accordingly to the needs um, and just yeah, reduce the opportunity costs, but also increase the opportunities that we can get just by being ready um, and have the resources whenever we need them. All of this is, um, is a cycle. It's a learning cycle. Um, it's a consistent improvement cycle of we integrate a solution, we model and automate it, we create transparency, recognize potential change because something may, might have not worked, we optimize it and then we integrate it again. And that's a never ending circle, um, which is also a bit of a change towards the traditional world where there were more bulky updates and changes and you couldn't be that flexible and dynamic um, as we can be now with, a, with the cloud. So in summary, um, our speakers today will evaluate how cloud-based encoding for video streaming works. Um, they will also explain on um, how they use virtualization automation in the cloud, um, and that will improve the flexibility of their work environment and the daily business for their journalists. Sorry. Um, they will also investigate in the performance and feature set of RIST and SRT for cloud ingest. Um, 
And just mentioning, we shouldn't forget that there are various clouds, um, public cloud or private cloud or even a hybrid cloud, and the decision what to use, of course, is um, depending on the use case for everyone. So just to give you two, two slides as a comparison um, for just to understand later on when you, when you listen to the presentations um, what it actually is about. So the presentations will include VVC and AV1 and, and a comparison. So VVC is currently uh, under development. Uh, it's, um, it's done by the joint video experts teams, so MPAC and VSEC whereas AV1 is developed by the Alliance of Open Media. It was last year. So, um, and actually it's royalty free, so that's a big plus of course. Um, VVC is being seen as a successor of HGVC, um, meaning H266 in that case. Um, and it promises a bit rate saving between 25 and 50%. Um, that's based on current um, experiments that they run um, but that's roughly the figures that we can expect. AV1 is already adopted by uh, YouTube, for example, so it's already implemented and reworked so examples, but it only has a similar performance as HEVC, um, and it's a bit more complex in terms of computational aspects. So there are pros and cons, of course, for both, and we will see later on uh, how the performances have been. I'm sure you've heard about SRT and RIST. Um, so if not, here's also a short comparison. SRT, the secure reliable transport, uh, as well as the RIST, the reliable internet stream transport. Uh, both are being widely used now or coming more and more into people's attention um, to, for, for the streaming technologies, actually. So SRT was developed in 2017 by High Vision. Um, and the strength was that it really achieved low latency internet video, video transport. It's open sourced by the SRT Alliance. Um, they also had a panel at IBC, so you might have heard about this um, in case you've been there. And um, SRT actually ex exists to support the encryption and multiple connection modes for the receiver. So depending, um, yeah, actually on, on, on which, which end to address. Um, it only requires the, the public IP address and that's it. While RIST requires basically the IP address of both sides, so it's a different communication and um, doesn't support encryption in that sense. It's um, open source by VLC, um, GStreamer and Uppipe. It's a a little bit of a newer technology because it was developed in 2018 uh, by the RIST Activity Group. It was also approved by the BSF. And it addresses the lack of com compatibility actually between devices and it defines a set of interoperability points um, through the use of existing or new standards and recommendations. So this interoperability aspect is always very um, interesting and very important when we talk about standards to really ensure that, um, yeah, legacy uh, implementations are not completely dead at that point. So with this, uh, I'd like to thank you and like to hand over to our next uh, speaker, to Linda Jedema, um, actually AlphaTac, but also technical director for Source Sound VR. lower the mic a few inches here. I, I have to do this at every conference if they don't give me a box to stand on. There we go. So let me make sure I get my slides right. It's always the, uh, the technical folks that have the most problem with their presentation. I don't know why that is. So um, uh, this afternoon's session at 4 o'clock in this room is going to be kind of a cross-section of you know, some new technologies and, and new processes coming out in audio. Um, so we, we start with um, Peilun and Steve from um, NVIDIA and Skywalker Sound, and they're going to be introducing NVIDIA, which is a new way 
to take immersive content down to uh, two-channel playback. We have uh, Roger Swanky from Meyer Sound Lab, and he's going to be discussing a way to um, use a new type of uh, test signal for testing speakers that is based more on uh, real live, uh, real world sound as opposed to just a, a straight test signal. And then we have Julian and Pierre from Del Air Labs. They're going to be discussing some of the challenges with um, placing speakers with regards to um, a solid display as opposed to being able to put them behind the screen as is traditionally done. So what's new in audio? Well, quite a bit, but unfortunately we don't have a lot of time to cover everything that's new coming out. Technology is constantly changing. So we are going to hit on three topics this afternoon at four, starting at four, delivering immersive audio, measuring loudspeakers, and working with solid cin uh, cinema screens. So from NVIDIA, sorry, I'm looking at the screen here. I don't have my glasses on, so I'm trying not to squint. Um, they're going to be touching on the fact that consumers tend to listen in stereo, but how do you deliver a highly immersive content over stereo, especially since so much content is you know, done for surround, um, Atmos, and even with virtual reality, we're having a 360, much more immersive playback now in c content creation. So they're introducing a new way of down mixing and delivering immersive content in stereo. And within this, they're going to take a look at some of the psychoacoustic aspects. Um, they, that's what their model is based on, is they took a look at how do humans actually hear and perceive sound in three-dimensional space, and how can they take that information and deliver it over uh, stereo, a simple stereo playback. Meyer Sound, is there a better way to measure loudspeakers? Because traditionally, um, you use test signals such as pink noise, but these don't really mimic um, a real-world signal. So the new, new uh, test approach that Myers will be presenting today is based on real-world signals. They've modeled real-world signals and created a new test source. Blair? They'll be taking a look at traditional perforated screens, typically put the speakers behind the screens, but this can lead to sonic issues that have been well documented, such as comb filtering, loss of in intelligibility in speech, um, roll off at high frequencies, and so on. The direct view, but looking at the new direct view displays out there, you can't put the speakers behind the screen. You have to put them above, but this leads to kind of its own issues including a lack of he cohesion because now you're separating the audio, especially if somebody's speaking, from the image of the person speaking. So they'll be in introducing a new technology that can hopefully overcome those obstacles. And during their presentation, they'll be comparing and contrasting speakers behind a traditional um, perforated screen with their new technology that places speakers above a direct view screen and how is that perceived out in the audience area? And that's it, sorry. Our, there's, this is less of a primer and more of just an overview because with three such different presentations, it's hard to kind of give a primer on all three. So I just wanted to give just a really quick inter, uh, introduction to what will be presented at starting at four today. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you.